All right, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight with, uh, with our presentation. Um, and thank you all for coming out tonight to Revit RVA. I'm Jeff Gravitt with CAD Microsystems. We're the sponsor of this user group. And uh, we're very honored to do that here at Mosley Architects. They've been so gracious to host us for this, uh, for this event. Um, and for those of you, do we have any uh, people that are first time people here at Revit RVA? Yeah, thank you for coming out. Uh, really appreciate it. And I, I see some familiar faces around the room here. Um, the idea with Revit RVA is that we have a group of people here that, uh, well, for, first of all, let me talk, talk, talk a little bit about CAD Microsystems. Uh, we run a couple user groups. We have four user groups that we run in the Mid Atlantic region right now. And uh, so this is one of them. So if you have any colleagues in other cities that might be interested in, in what we do here tonight, uh, this is very similar to what we do in all the, all the other cities. So we uh, share uh, speakers. Uh, Dana, actually one of our speakers tonight, came down from uh, Washington, D.C. To, uh, to present to you tonight. So uh, hopefully the quality of the, the, the presentation you see tonight or what you'll see at the, uh, the other user groups that uh, we have here. And it's all um, driven um, to really th for this purpose, really to bring people together, to innovate, and to really, uh, so, you know, community to support each other. So that's what this is about. It's about you all. It's about connecting you all so that uh, you're applying this technology to your business uh, in, the, in the best ways that... Uh, that um, <clears throat> you know, the other groups is. So, and, and one of the ways that we make sure that we're still relevant, that we get great uh, agendas here, is by uh, filling out these surveys. So you, each of you will get a survey. Please take the five minutes to throw ideas out there. Top of the mind ideas are typically the best. This helps drive the, uh, the, uh, the agendas here and, and what we select. And this is uh, a board of advisors that uh, meets after the, each one of these meetings so that we do, do it to select what we do at each of the other meetings. So I mean, this is all driven by your surveys and, and what uh, you all want to see. So uh, please fill those out. Um, so before I get on to tonight's agenda, uh, I just want to mention that uh, we are, I think there are about uh, 6 billion people in the world right now. About 3 billion have access to the internet. So possibly 3 billion people could be watching this tonight. Um, we're being broadcast to the world uh, over YouTube. And uh, we're trying to figure out how to do this with this group and other groups. So uh, in the future, we, we have a live feed going tonight, right, Donnie? So if, if you're at home and you're sitting around and you really want to be at the user group, you'll be able to log in and do that. Uh, and this is for people, obviously, that can't make it for whatever reason or people in, in other cities. So what we're doing is we are broadcasting this live. We are capturing this. And uh, uh, so if you see something that you like at a user group that you'd like to you know, show somebody, you can go to, hey, you know, Two minutes, 75 seconds into the, 75 seconds, two minutes and 15 seconds into the presentation, say, hey, this is you should really look at this. That's the idea, is to give you, you know, if you see a tip or you, you, you want to uh, relate to somebody, then, then you'll be able to do that, um, you know, after the meeting. So we're going to do this all the meetings. So all the meetings uh, uh, at some point this year, hopefully, will be broadcast live. So if you see agenda you like, uh, or and you can watch it later or, or live at these meetings. So I just wanted to mention that. Anyway, uh, we're going to switch up the agenda tonight. Uh, 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 we're going to flip it. So Dana's going to go first um, because uh, we were trying to broadcast this and just uh, her machine set up first, and then we'll hear from Chris Harrison. So first, uh, let's have a big round of applause for Dana. First, first of all, she's coming down all the way from D.C., and she was the top presenter at Autodesk University, first time presenter last year. So that's a big round of applause for Dana for coming down for us and presenting tonight. So thank you. And I'm going to pass the mic to her because we have to use this mic so that 3 billion people can hear us. All right. You guys can hear me, hopefully. Awesome. Okay. So I'm, I'm Dana DeFilippi. Um, I'm from D.C. I currently work at Smith Group. I'm the Revit chick in my office. I have a background in architectural production. Um, and I was always the one that wanted to make things more efficient. So I moved over to the bib side quite a, quite a while ago. And as, uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm also part of the Revit DC advisory board. So definitely appreciate all the survey comments and all that good stuff. All right, so what we're gonna talk about today. Um, before I start, architects in the room? Hands? Engineers, okay. Uh, people who have done life safety calculations. Okay, quite a few. Opened Dynamo. Oh, okay. All right, all right. We're going to get you there. We're going to get you there. This is not a Dynamo session. I'm not going to teach you how to use Dynamo. I taught that last December, I think. Maybe I'll teach it again sometime um, here in, in, at Mosley. Um, but everything that I go through here today, I'm going to give to you. You can dissect it. Um, this is actually how I got my start in Dynamo. So 
encourage you guys to get in there. It's a lot of fun um, just running the scripts. Just start there. All right. So we're going to go through what it is for the occupancy calculation, number of occupants in a space. Life safety is tons of calculations. We're going to talk about this one in particular. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to develop an area scheme. And this is going to be an area scheme specifically for life safety. We're going to generate some area boundary lines, right? We've done this, right? Hands. Area bound boundary lines, calculate square footage in a space. Awesome. Okay. Um, we're going to import some stuff. We're going to generate some calculated values. We're going to talk about, you know, kind of quirks in the calculation. Uh, make it easier for our users by creating some conditional formatting. And we're going dis to discuss how to deal with future changes, right? Spaces change, buildings change, think at VE, right? So how the number of occupancy changes as, as the building changes. So I will say this is a topic near and dear to my heart. You'll see I, I actually t uh, put this up on Instagram, my first Dynamo script. I was so excited about it. Um, so my first Dynamo graph ever was related to occupancy calculations. This is something specifically that I learned Dynamo for. Um, so I've been doing this for over three years. And you'll see that that date there is a Saturday. So something that I, I really, really enjoy. I'm really passionate about this. I've been doing it for a really long time. So why this? Why did I learn Dynamo for this? Well, everybody here, if you've worked in Revit occupancy calculations, you probably know that it's not the best system, right? It's not really set up to do what you want it to do. If you Google it, you'll see there's 69,000 results in a you know, quarter of a, of a second, right? So essentially, we don't want to automate everything, right? When we automate something, we want to make sure that what I use, usually say is the juice is worth the squeeze, right? So First of all, I don't want to export anything. I want it all to be in Revit. I want uh, to be able to share key values. Um, essentially, there, this is a handicap within Revit, which is why I learned Dynamo. Um, you also cannot tag calculated values. So this is actually, once again, my first Dynamo script, was getting over these hurdles that Revit cannot do. Luckily, in Revit 2017, you're able to calculate values in tags, which is nice. We'll talk about that. Um, for those of you who have worked in life safety, you may be aware that there's multiple jurisdictions, which means there, there's multiple codes, which means there's different calculations depending on where you live. So I want to be able to import that data depending on where my location is. If you only have one location, lucky you. Um, we also want to automate some things. So, for example, boundary lines, right? If you've ever had to draw area boundary lines, I've automated it for you. So before we get started, um, for those of you who are familiar with Dynamo, it's open source. People can create custom nodes. And this is really fantastic. It's a really great way for us to share within the industry. So we need three packages here, and I'm going to share them with you. Um, Archilab, Archilab Bumblebee, and Clockwork for Dynamo help me do this within Dynamo. Awesome. So number of occupants. So essentially the code book, the International Building Code, says that essentially you take an area of a space, you divide it by a load factor, right? What, what is given to you based off the code, and then that equals your numbers of occupants, right? So it seems pretty straightforward, right? So the first step we need to do is think about area. So I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox here. I'm using areas and not rooms in Revit, and there's a few reasons why. First off, areas um, are not as restrictive as rooms. You'll see that rooms only calculate based off of one face of the wall, right? For life safety, we need to go to the center of the wall, the exterior of the wall, different faces of the walls. We can use um, also walls, columns, room separation lines. There's a lot of things that bound rooms. So sometimes it gets ambiguous. The lines get fuzzy between what's actually calculating what's not. We can use a room separator, right? If we go in there and just tell the wall not to be room bounding, but then of course we're going to get lots of warnings. This isn't necessarily something that's going to cause a lot of problems in your model, but this will lead to thousands of warnings, right? It's something that I like to avoid as the Revit girl in my office. Also, um, an area dictated by the life safety code, right, may actually encompass multiple rooms, right? So kind of want to keep it as a separate space. You'll show here that the tooltip for areas actually shows a residential unit. 
right? So that's multiple bedrooms, a kitchen, living room, et cetera. And my favorite part is it keeps it separate, right? An area scheme is actually separate plans, all of that, which essentially you actually have to go into the plans to start manipulating those things. It's usually something more intentional, right? So you're gonna see less things deleted, less things missing, right? Like we do with rooms. Protect those things. Uh, we'll say that with this, as I was mentioning, um, we've created this area scheme. We can go into the area schemes and create a new one. Out of the box, we get gross building and rentable, so we can just go in there and add as many as we need, right? We could create one for BOMA, FAR, whatever we need area calculations for. I've created one for life safety. Now with this, uh, I will say that we're going to need to um, create some boundary lines. So this is essentially what bounds an area. It's not looking at walls, rooms, any of those, right? So this goes into what's referred to as area type rules. I'm not gonna go into this, unfortunately I don't have much time, but I've provided some links here if you guys are interested in how Revit calculates area. It's not how life safety does, so we're just gonna ignore it for the time being. Um, essentially, gross versus net is how we're gonna calculate life safety spaces. And you'll see, once again, this is the International Building Code, um, right from section 10. Um, that essentially dictates my occupancy load factor and whether it's a gross or net space. Um, so the gross area is going to allow for the deduction of exterior walls, vent shafts, et cetera. Net area actually excludes more. So permanent fixtures such as desks, things like that we can actually omit. Once again, you can read the code yourself. So area boundaries. If we've ever had to do this, we're gonna go in and we're gonna place some area boundaries. We do get the option to pick walls, right? So if we wanted to go to the center or what have you. But notice up in the modify bar, this is something I encourage everybody to check out. It will automatically check apply area rules. And this is actually what we don't wanna do. So make sure you uncheck that, just a little tip. So we draw our area boundaries, right? This is something really tedious. Um, now, once again, I did just get on my soapbox about why we don't use rooms, but rooms already have boundaries, right? So we can start there. So what I've done is I've created uh, you'll see I have three Dynamo scripts that basically work with my process. I specify a level and my, my area scheme. So this could actually work for FAR and BOMA as well. And it will automate my area boundary lines based off of my room boundaries. Right, so it gives me a starting point so that I don't have to draw them all manually. Right, so we're waiting for it to read all of our area boundary lines. It takes a moment. And you'll see all my area boundary lines are there. Okay. This is the uh, Dynamo script. Once again, I am gonna give this to you. This is a relatively basic script. I don't wanna scare you guys. But essentially what I'm doing here is I'm selecting the room boundaries. Clockwork is helping me here. And I'm converting them into area boundaries. So once I have my area boundary lines, I can then place some areas. Uh, once again, you'll notice that it tags on placement. And you'll see that this is actually somewhat important because I need to use this specific tag, right? So you'll see here that I'm actually using the life safety occupancy load tag. We're gonna talk specifically about this tag in a bit. So one thing about areas and that everybody needs to be a little bit mindful of is that if somebody goes in there and deletes your area scheme, unfortunately it's gonna delete a lot of stuff with it. It's gonna delete your plans, your boundaries, your areas, your schedules, anything associated to that area, which is great because it kind of houses it all in one little department, but just gotta be mindful that it is kind of all encompassed within the scheme. All right, so I've tried to color code some things here. One, this is a great large screen, so hopefully everybody can see this. I do have a handout later um, that you guys will be provided with, but essentially I have four different types of inputs. The orange ones are the user driven ones that you guys are gonna determine, right? So there's only four of those. I have some light blue ones. Those are actually coming directly from Dynamo. Some gray ones, those are key schedules. Who's worked with key schedules in here? Awesome, key schedules are great. And we also have one calculated value, which is a formula for number of occupants, right? The area divided by occupancy load. Now notice I already have two of them, right? I already have my uh, name, which I've, I haven't renamed, it's just area, and the square footage, which is automatically dictated to those locations of the area boundary lines, right? Once I move those area boundary lines, my square footage changes. 
All right, moving right along. So now we've talked about area, right? Now we need to talk about the occupancy load factor, what that guy does. So once again, this is a table from the International Building Code. Um, and depending on um, what jurisdiction you're in, you're gonna have a different table. So um, you'll see here, I'm actually gonna create a schedule, but rather than a regular schedule, I'm gonna create a schedule of keys. If you guys haven't created the, these before, they're definitely worth something looking into. They're widely used for all different types of things, door hardware, um, room finishes, etc. And when I do that, I'm actually gonna create three additional parameters. Occupancy load factor, whether it's no net, net, gross, or fixed, basically just tell my user, and then where that code source is coming from, whether it's International Building Code, NFPA, whatever it might be. Notice also that I put key as a suffix there. This is specifically so that my user knows that it's driven by a key value, right? Okay. So you'll see here, once I create that schedule, I can come up and I can insert data rows. This is something that my users were doing before I created this Dynamo script, is they would come in here and they would create a new data row for every load function that they had, occupancy load function. So what we're gonna do um, is once you associate that, you'll see that the, the three additional parameters come with it, right? So it's a way of associating data to one, a key, essentially, okay? Now, once again, um, what do we do? Because there's multiple code sources. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a Dynamo script, which actually reads an Excel file, which I'm gonna show you guys. So we come in here and we specify what the code is, what year it is, and this key scheduled name. And we're gonna run the script and it's gonna bring in all those functions of space for me based off of that Excel file, okay? So let's look at the voodoo behind that. This is my Excel file. You'll see down at the bottom, I have different workbooks or sheets which dictate each uh, function, or I'm sorry, code, right? Uh, and I also have the last cell and table up in the top right, which basically tells my uh, Dynamo script how many values to bring in. <laughs> Excuse me. So looking at the script here, a little bit more uh, wires here, a little bit more complicated, but essentially you'll see that the inputs are in pink there. Those are what you saw in the Dynamo player. Um, but essentially I am reading the Excel file and I'm putting it into my key schedule. You'll see that the last cell and table is actually just giving me the extent of data that I'm putting in. And then um, I'm using the Arcalab Bumblebee as well to populate in the key schedule, right? So I'm pushing the data from Excel right to, uh, to my key schedule based off of those pink inputs that the user specifies. All right, so here we go. Now you'll see that as I specify those different load functions, it's going to update those gray values. Do you see that, how they're updating in the back? So depending on which key you select or function of space you select, it will automatically give you those gray values, right? So it's associating values together. Awesome. So now we're getting pretty far, right? We have a, quite a few of our, our inputs here. We're just missing a few. So now we're off on to number of occupants, right? We got the area, we got the occupant load factor, number of occupants. So how do we calculate this in Revit? Well, it does come down to a little bit of units. So it gets a little bit fresh, uh, a little bit complicating here. All right, so we have our, our calculation. We need to normalize the units. So because area is square footage, I'm gonna divide it by one square foot. Okay, so now I'm left with a number and not square foot. Does that make sense to everybody, hopefully? Um, then essentially I'm gonna round up because we can't have part of an occupant, right? I can't have 10.4 people, right? So I'm gonna round up to 11 people. Awesome. So you'll see there that I have three values. I have my key value, my area, and my occupant load, right? So we're gonna divide area by our occupant load to get our occupant value, right? Um, unfortunately, um, there's some limitations with key values. You can, in fact, do this. However, this value cannot be shared, so I can't tag it that way. So I've created a little bit of a workaround, all right? Very, very basic script. I think that all of you guys could do this. I'm essentially gonna move the data from that key value over to the blue value, that light blue dynamo populated value, right? Um, so I'm gonna use that in my calculation instead. 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to run my copy op occupant load factor. You see it's super quick. Just copies that number right over to my occupant load factor, the light blue one. And now I have 227 occupants. You guys see that? All right. So this Dynamo script, pretty straightforward. Um, I think all of you guys could do this. I have faith that all of you, because you're here tonight, you have passion and you can do this. All right. So we're taking our areas. You'll see that. Category of areas, taking all elements of category, getting that parameter value, and I'm copying it to that value, right? Pretty straightforward. All right, however, there's a catch. The code specifically says for areas without fixed seats, this is the calculation. If you have fixed seats, this is an auditorium, then it's actually the fixed seat count, right? So if you have 300 auditorium seats, that's your occupant value. Okay, so we have to change our calculation a little bit. Pretty, pretty easy. So what we're gonna do is we're basically gonna build in a conditional format, an if-then statement, right? So it basically says, if, you'll see that my light blue value over there at the top right with the arrow pointing to it, if LS fixed occupant load, load is checked, then use the fixed occupant value, which is actually the one on the very far right, the, the orange value fixed occupancy load override. Otherwise, if it's not checked, then use the regular calculation, okay? So essentially, what I'm gonna do, and you'll see, because that's a key value, I already know the light gray arrow, it already knows, that space knows that it's fixed. So I can use that data with Dynamo, and I can check that box utilizing Dynamo so that my user doesn't have to do it, right? So that script that I said was so easy, it's a little bit more complicated, but that's okay. All right, so I pick something that has a fixed property. I run my copy occupant load factor script, and you'll notice it automatically checks off the column I. Then through conditional formatting within my schedule, you'll see that it turned red, indicating to my user that requires a value. How many fixed seats do you have? Then you'll notice that my occupant load, the dark blue value becomes that value. Everybody see that? This is also something that the engineers use at my firm if they worked out with something with the jurisdiction. Maybe they say, hey, we, this says that it needs 400 occupants, but we actually I think we need, only need 300 there. So they'll check this box and then just put in the 300. It's a way of overriding the value. Okay. So that Dynamo script gets a little bit more complicated, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm asking the area if it's fixed. And if it is fixed, I'm checking that checkbox. Then, um, essentially what I'm doing is I am um, giving a zero value to that fixed occupancy load override value, the J column, for the conditional formatting statement. All right, so I'm trying to speed up here a little bit. I don't know what time it is. But you'll see here I'm adding a conditional format under the formatting tab within my schedule that basically says... If that checkbox is checked, right, if LS fixed occupancy load is checked and the occupancy load override is zero, which means that somebody hasn't gone in there and put in 250, then make it red, right? Which basically tells my user it needs an input, right? Tell me what my occupancy load is. Awesome. How are you doing with that? Nobody knows. Okay. So once again, we're going to get back to that tag, right? So my schedule's right, but now I need it to be right on the plan. Right? I need to tell my tag or my area on the plan what the occupancy load is, area, all of that good value, right? And what the, the uh, occupancy is. So pretty straightforward here, right? We have our name, number of occupants, and area. However, the number of occupants is a calculation. Calculations aren't shared, right? So essentially what I have to do is I have to create that same calculated value in the tag family, right? So I go into the tag family, right? We've all been in here. Edit family, go into the tag, and we're going to edit the label. And essentially, we're going to create a calculated value that is exactly that same that formula, right? So that my schedule and my tag are reading the exact same formula with the conditional formatting built in to catch my fixed seating. Okay, so now my schedule's reading the formula, my tag's reading the formula, we'll load that in, everything's reading the same values. Awesome. So the workflow in action, right? This is this video I created. It's, I believe, six times fast. 
essentially we're going to come in here, we're going to create our area boundary lines, right? So we already have our plan, our area scheme, and assuming we have some rooms, right? So it creates the area boundary lines from the rooms. A little bit of the user part, right? We have to come in here and we have to place the areas. I haven't created Dynamo script for this yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe soon. Once that's done, we're going to go ahead and bring in our functions of space, right? So you'll see there, we're going to go into our, our uh, Dynamo schedule here, edit some inputs, specify what our code version is, run that, loads in our function of space keys, and now we can associate those to our areas, right? So we can go in there and we can say, okay, we have some classrooms, you know, some general spaces, restrooms, anything that's going to be occupied, right? We can go ahead and assign a function of it. And you'll see that as I do that, the gray values, our keys, are automatically populating in the back, right? I believe in total, like, calculated the occupancy for the advanced project in Revit in six minutes. So then I copy the occupancy load factors. I have one fixed space, I tell it what the space is, and now I have 487 total occupants for my floor. Right, super easy. Everybody could do that here. However, there's gonna be changes, right? Our building is gonna move, we're gonna get some walls, changes areas are gonna change, we're gonna change functions of spaces. So some scenarios here. <clears throat> First, the area boundary line moves, right? So you'll see there, my boundary line is now falling over top of the columns. Everybody see that? So my area automatically updates, right? Because it's driven based off those area boundary lines. If my area boundary lines move, square footage changes. So this is an automatic change. You'll see that as my, my uh, area changes, my occupancy load automatically updates, right? So there's no work that I need to do. All I need to do is change the area boundary line. So as I was saying, I generated this from the rooms. Well, now you can go in here and you can move the lines around and make them based off the gross versus net calculation that you need. And as you do that, your occupancy load values will automatically update in the back. All right, then let's just say your override changes, right? So you go in there and you're, um, you, you know, you have less, <coughs> excuse me, you have less seats. No longer do you have six tables, you have five tables. We're going to assume they're fixed. So that is an automatic change as well. Because once again, it's reading right from the formula. Because it's a fixed seat, it's automatically going to change. So your function of space changes, right? So we decide to use a, an unconcentrated space with a 15 occupancy load factor rather than the seven. This is going to require one additional step. So we change the value, right? We go in there, we change our, our key value, that automatically changes our gray values, right? But remember, our calculation is actually coming from the light blue value. And that didn't change. You see, the seven stayed the same. So what I need to do is I need to run the Dynamo script, the copy occupant load factor script, and that will automatically copy the value over and update my occupant load factor. Looks like I have a little bit of an error there. <clears throat> then, Let's just say that you talk with the jurisdiction, right? They'd say, oh, you don't need to use the seven, use the 15 occupancy load factor. So you change that in the background, right? But once again, it's not using that value. It's using the light gray or light blue value. So we're gonna copy that value over. So essentially both of those processes, anything that changes your uh, function of space key values, you're gonna just copy the occupant load factors using the Dynamo script. So this is something that I usually will tell my users, just run this before you print, right? And then you know that all your values are right, that are, they're all coming from the, the same value. So kind of a QA thing, if you will. So we've automated it. So what do you need to do this? You need the area scheme life safety. You need to bring in my area schedules, right? The color coded ones. So the, the area value, uh, the area schedule with all those different code values, and then the function of space key that we populate through Excel, right? You need some Dynamo packages, which I talked about at the beginning, and you need my three Dynamo scripts. And lastly, the area tag. This is all in my Google Drive. So you guys can get all of this stuff right from there. The Dynamo scripts, this presentation, the handout that went with it, the... Um, the Revit sample file that has everything with it, the schedules and all that good stuff. 
You guys can just bring it right into your project and hopefully get it to work. Any questions? It's a lot of information. I know. What time is that? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Great. Great. Perfect. Okay, so don't forget um, to the survey. You guys should get an email or something. I love comments. Constructive or fine. Um, I have tough skin right here. Um, I know I, I went very fast. So any, any questions? I want to leave it open. I think we have like 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah? Any questions on any of this? Went super fast. So it was a lot. How do you keep a few updates the Dynamo packages Yes. So that's a very good question. So I am, um, like I said, the Revit girl in my office. And I actually am lucky enough to have a team of people that are really great at what they do. I kind of own the Dynamo packages. So I make sure that they're up to date, that the Dynamo scripts are working. You know, I field all those problems when something's not working. So, so Dynamo it gets automatically installed with Revit in the newer versions in particular. Um, so hopefully you should have Dynamo already. If you don't, you, it's free. You can get it. It's super easy. Um, you can get it right from the website. That's definitely something that I encourage everybody to do. Go to the Dynamo website. People are so great on there. Even if you don't have a question, just go through and see what some of the problems people are coming up with. If you do have a problem, post on there. You'll see immediate responses. Um, with that being said, um, we, Smith Group, is lucky enough to be a big enough firm that when we do the install, it automatically paths to those places. Um, I will say that Dynamo has a lot of quirks, just like Revit does, right? That's why I have a job. I don't know about you guys. But um, so it has some problems with server size and some, some weird oddities. Um, so we're actually working on copying all the packages down to the local location. So, you know, that's something that I've worked really closely with my IT to start mandating is that it searches for updates to that folder and copies the changes down so that everything is driven from the C drive location. I'm getting super dirty over here. So luckily, luckily there was a, a giant shift in versioning for Dynamo recently. We have Dynamo 2.0 now, 2.02 or something we're up to. And um, so it's, it's a completely different setup than Dynamo 1. Luckily for you guys, I provided both versions of the scripts, so you're welcome. Um, but yes, that's something that I definitely had to do. Um, and in re the new API in Dynamo, it actually finds more categories. So all of my category lists got messed up. So I have to, you know, there's just weird quirks that you have to start to think about. Um, no. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, so it, I think it's stabilizing a lot. I, I think that we're going to see a lot less problems with the new platform in Dyno, Dynamo 2. So hopefully, especially for those of you that are going to be new Dynamo users, you won't have to deal with that too much. Um, and hopefully going forward, it's not an issue. But once again, you just kind of... I live my whole life. I'm the Dynamo girl in my office, totally. I'll, I'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll say that um, th it, this provides a huge shift in our industry. In, in 10 years, if you don't know about computation and how computation will help you, you're going to have a really hard time finding a job, especially as a new architect um, or new engineer. Um, this, is, this is where our industry is going. And, you know, I, I'm luckily enough to able, be able to track people and what they do and whether they're using my tools. And if they're not, I bring my ruler over, you know, and because they're, they're really wasting time. They're, they're legitimately wasting time. They're manually transcribing stuff. They're adding data rows. They're doing stuff which I've created efficiency scripts for, right? So, you know, they could have created five plans in the time they created one. Um, so, it, you know, definitely coaching, making it available, making it, you know, the documentation there, creating these presentations and making it so that, you know, the, the community starts to understand where this stuff goes. Um, 
I'm, I'm thinking about doing a presentation next year at AU on quality control scripts. So updating your key plan automatically, right? Your, your sheet says that it's area A. I can read that in Dynamo and check the box that says area A for your key plan. Don't open up every sheet and do that. Run my script, right? You can do that with graphic scales. It knows that it's an eighth. Check the box for an eighth graphic scale, right? So you just run the script before you print, and you know it's bright. A lot less red lines. So I definitely encourage you guys. Um, this is where I got my start in Dynamo. I'm obviously very passionate about it. You guys can reach out to me. I have some cards here if you guys want to come chat afterwards. So. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. It, Dynamo, you can create what's referred to as a bounding box. So you can get those area boundary lines and essentially extrude a geometry from it. I work mostly with data in Dynamo. I'm pushing data around for construction documentation, but there's so much that you can do with geometry. So that's usually where you see computation used is the early on side of, of design, right? I don't use it for that. I use it for production. Any other questions? We'll be here for a while. Right, yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you have a question? Go ahead, go ahead. Always get this question. So uh, plumbing calculations are very closely tied to these calculations. And yes, you can. It becomes a little bit more of an obstacle. Um, so I was referring to the custom packages. I'm going to be a little bit of a nerd. I have my own custom package called Dynamo. <laughs> and it, um, it is specifically for plumbing calculations. So it, it looks and you can spe specify whether it's an A3 or an A2 or whatever it has. And then you can use all these values in the calculations. It's crazy. I mean, it's... it's it's a lot. That's why I had to create my own custom package. So, Seven great question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dana. That was, that was wonderful. And, I, and Chris, why don't you go ahead and get, get connected up there? Um, and I think Dana brought a good, good point about computational design. Like, it's this is happening. It's happening in a lot of different places. I would say a good majority of our customer base is really dipping their toe in, the, in this pool. But when you see the automation happen, like Dana says, if people aren't using these scripts, you're literally wasting time. So I, th I think it's, it'd be worth you know, looking into um, going to the Dynamo website and looking into the problems that are being solved at, at the very least, because it is, it is amazing how this has grown in such a short amount of time, mostly because there's a lot of problems that are pretty easy to solve with a, you know, if you just, you know, apply a little bit of, of logic to them. And the, and the community is so great with sharing all this information too. So, so anyway, uh, thank you, Dana. And now we're going to hear from Chris on uh, family values. <laughs> okay, get some little advice first. So let's have a big applause for Chris. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I mean, when Revit came out with the term families, who cannot have fun with this term as you go through it, right? So um, this presentation tries to focus on um, some little more practical applications relative to uh, family formulas and how they can be used when creating families. Uh, how many folks have created families before? Awesome. How many people have used formulas in their family? Good. So this might not be new to you, but um, we the, the intent is to leverage the uh, families and the values um, and the formulas in such a way that at the end, the end user is using a much better um, uh, family and they've got a lot more choices on hand. They can't load it in, go, oh wait, this isn't right, I gotta do this, gotta do that, start over, and all of a sudden you end up with a myriad of little variations floating around. So um, again, just a couple quick examples here of what we're doing. At uh, Quinn Evans, this would be our typical uh, sheet title block. And this is the family view of that same file. There's a lot of stuff packed in here, uh, but I wanna focus on a couple things. One is the title or the address portion up in the top uh, right-hand corner. Within the project, this is what the user would see. When they click on the um, title block and they pull up the type properties under identity data, they see 
uh, office with the zero, uh, but there's five grayed out sections below it for the offices that we have um, in the organization. This is the same view within the family, and those blocks of text are individual uh, addresses. And what I did here was each uh, address becomes a group um, of two text boxes, the address and then the, um, the phone number below it. Each uh, text box then gets a yes, no parameter that assigns it to one of the uh, offices. In this case, it would be DC, Detroit, Ann Arbor, so on and so forth. The other value that I added was the term office at the top. And that um, parameter is set to an integer which then would correspond to the address below. So the user goes in and he hits uh, three for Ann Arbor and the Ann Arbor address pops up. And that works very well with the title block throughout. But again, in my family, as you can see here, I've got cover sheet information that's plugged into it as well. So in this case, uh, I'm going to focus on the text that's over on the far right, or sorry, on the left, where we're all blocked up like that. In this case, the um, value for the address is referred to as um, the, same, the same nomenclature, 01 DC cover, 02, or Detroit cover, but this time it's got cover in it. Um, and this is how the project looks. And you can see there's three and three, and everything is still grayed out. Within the family, this is the way it looks. Again, not, not, much, not that much different except for the formula portion of it. And in this case, I need to tell it, let me back up a slide. You'll see within the project, up at the very top, it says cover sheet, which is checked. So within the family, the parameter or the formula now says um, cover sheet, if cover sheet, well it doesn't say if, it says and cover sheet and then office cover equals the integer. You will also notice that up at the, uh, under the term office cover, there's a three, but it also says office under the formula. So I'm repeating the value that's coming from office right in to the, um, the value for the cover sheet portion. The end result is that when the user clicks three um, or types in three for the office, he gets the title block and the cover sheet address automatically dropped into place without any issues. Another example of how all of this works together is some cases we're going to need a uh, stamp. In this case, we have two, a liability, waiver of liability, and a drawing record. And you can see those in red. And this is what the project view looks like. Again, within the family, you can see the big red blocks over in the title block side. And here, the values uh, within the project there is a checkbox that says, turn the stamp on. And then there, right below it, says liability stamp with the checkbox. But you also see the two gray lines below it, which is um, record, record doc stamp and show liability. So within the family, this is the way it looks. I've got two stamps, and in this case, they're annotation families. Um, it was just a little easier to generate them as an annotation family and drop it into the title block. And then what I've got is the parameter that says turn the stamp on or off. And then the two, basically what's driving it are the two formulas right below it, which is stamp on and not liability stamp. The one right below it stamps on liability stamp. So here the idea is that once stamp is turned on, we're then telling it to either show the liability stamp or show the record document stamp. 
if the stamp box is checked off, then both of them, then neither of those uh, appear. And this is the way it would look for the user if he turns on stamps and says, I don't want the liability stamp. By default, it automatically gives you the record drawing because it's not liability stamp, therefore, turn it on. Another example of where I used a lot of formulas was in toilet partitions. Uh, this one took quite a while to build, but um, there was a layering process that went on here, uh, and hopefully you'll see parts of it as we go through this. Um, in this third example here, we're basically gonna be talking about a couple different parameters. Um, we've got the ability to um, do a floor mounted toilet or a wall mounted toilet. And this is what the user is seeing inside the project when he's placed it on there. So here is the um, floor version and here is the wall version. And you notice that all they had to do was uncheck one of them, the other one automatically came on. So this is what the family looks like um, in plan form. And as you can see there, we've got um, a pretty simple formula, not floor toilet. So I get one or the other by default, no matter what. Uh, and that's been, we, we've had some QC projects where somebody's checked everything on and there's a nasty looking mess in the middle because all of a sudden like, oh, I forgot to turn all those others off or they turn everything off and not realize that they needed some, to show something. So here, again, it was set up so that you, you were forced to show one or the other. You didn't have a choice. The other, th the other um, piece that took a little bit of time was showing, within families, we can do coarse, medium, and fine. And for the toilet partition, we set it up so that at, at a coarse level, you can see on the left, it's just basic line work. Um, the middle view is showing what it looks like at um, medium and fine. And then the one on the far right is what it looks like with fine. And in this case, all we've done is turned on the toilet accessories. In this case, the paper towel dispenser, toilet paper dispenser. And by the way, in this particular family, um, in the toilet accessory family, the um, dispensers and all the accessories are taggable. So again, the idea here is that the user can drop the toilet, the uh, toilet partition in, get it configured right, lay it all out, depending on its scale at a um, at an overall floor plan scale. We don't have a bunch of graphics um, changing things, or we haven't written a lot of um, filters to filter out things. Uh, and then at the fine level, which might be at quarter scale or half scale, I can start to see and tag my toilet accessories. Another example of being able to use um, various uh, scales is, a, is the fire extinguisher cabinet. In this example, I completely changed the graphic for the coarse version, which is on the left. So this would work great at a 16th scale where I still need to see what that, where we have, where has somebody has placed those. They're showing up on my life safety plan uh, with this graphic. And then for coarse and, med uh, coarse and fine, they're pretty much the same. The difference between these two, of course, is fire extinguisher one is a recessed version and fire extinguisher two is a surface mounted. So in this case, uh, while I didn't show it, they are instance parameters to let the user decide if it should be surface mounted or recessed. Uh, if it is a surface mounted one uh, at coarse scale, it would say FEC2. And I know I went pretty quick with some of these, but here are some formulas for good family values. Uh, definitely leveraging the not parameter um, in fact, it came up today. We were discussing something and um, a user was trying to do something with the door and she kept 
Um, she wanted it as an instance parameter, but was still trying to make duplicate types for the various conditions. And I, we realized with an, as an instance parameter, we could use the not variable. The parameter equals integer uh, would be the office equals three, four, five, that sort of thing. Um, that and the next two or the next one below it are definitely uh, ones that allow you to generate more options besides a or B when creating a family. Uh, and then the last one, of course, is trying to leverage coarse, medium, and fine in the line work so that we're not doing a lot of uh, filter overrides um, just to make something look good at the right scale. So I hope all that made sense. And I know it went pretty quick, but if you got questions, let me know. Anybody have any questions? Actually, that's a good point. Um, so we actually we actually do change it as a type parameter. I didn't show it as such, but you will see here uh, at the very top it says floor mounted. And even though I have toilet un or floor, even though I have floor mounted unchecked, um, that was more for purposes of the presentation. So the user would get. You're, it's a good point. The user is going to get a floor mounted, here it is, or it's going to be a wall mounted, here is the family. Um, the toilet doesn't need to be an instance parameter every time they drop a toilet in and have to make a choice. Do you, do you see a substantial advantage to using the number in your title block? versus just giving users the checkboxes and not forcing them to know which number is associated with which office? That's a good point. Um, I think that the, the advantage to the numbering system in this case is that I'm still, they still have to make one choice. They can't accidentally turn them all off or turn them all on. I'm still making them choose one, and that's the one I want to see. Um, I've got some users that are click happy, so they're always clicking the mouse as they're moving it. So um, that's one reason. And I think that's it, that actually allows it to be expanded a lot quicker without having to go back in and add a bunch of other changes. I mean, I can see this applying to um, a lot of other conditions where the geometry might drastically change that's not height, width, and depth of an object, but it might be, um, adding on other pieces. And so I want to be able to say, turn on this piece, turn off that piece. And I get a lot of different choices that way. So, yes, sir. Um, looking at your parameters, you have the office parameter and the office cover parameter. Um, is there an instance where you have one office and a different office cover? Or, I mean, I, I was just wondering why you wouldn't have the cover being driven by the office number. because they are two different, um, they're two different type parameters. I have a type uh, family that's cover and a type family that's sheet. And because of that, I can't, um, I need to be able to say if the cover is turned on, then show this title block. Um, I didn't actually try it when I built it to see if to apply it back to say one DC or two Detroit or Ann Arbor, that sort of thing. Um, but I did, yeah, so th it's still a work in progress. Yeah. I, I think that's a great idea. I really do. I've worked in places where we had three or four check boxes and yeah, we had the experience where multiple offices were checked or sometimes they weren't. I really like the way you got it set up. Mm -hmm. The other happy accident was typing in office under the 
office cover version and realizing that I could change it once and it picked up both of them. So again, I'm not having the mistake of the cover sheet gives a different address than the title block on all the other sheets. So there's still the same set of information and the user only has to, has to hit it once. And in all of these examples, what I'm trying to do is find ways to uh, improve the um, information that the user has access to relative to a family, like that toilet partition again, it's used heavily. It did take a while to build, but once people understood how it worked, they love it. Um, it you know, we can generate a, a bathroom a lot quicker with that one particular piece. Um, there are lots of other examples where folks have gone in and tried to do a detail annotation or use groups to embellish the wall sections when you can point them to a family and say, you spend 10 minutes here and it will be repaid for you every time you touch that particular portion in every wall section all the way down. Um, it's also easier because now you only have one family to update, right? Like I have a cover page and the sheet page, right? So if the information changes, I have to change it in both places. I, I think right. that's awesome. Right. right. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a lot in this. What I didn't talk about yet was vicinity maps, um, project data. Those are obviously just values that are yes, no, they're going to turn on as part of the cover sheet. Um, what broke when I brought it into 2019 was drawing index. The idea with drawing index is that it actually slides. Um, the right portion of that line is anchored. The left portion slides left or right. So if you are automatically generating, if you've got a small set and you can get all your drawing list on the cover sheet, that's what we would prefer. But it, it can fill up two columns, it can fill up eight columns. And so the user then slides left or right what he, in terms of how much room he wants to do to be able to use that all the way through. Have you experimented with and had any successes or failures with trying to associate that office number with the project local parameter to try and get, like, make sure you don't have Detroit checked on one sheet and Richmond checked on another or anything like that? I have not. Um, but again, the um, those are type parameters, not necessarily instance parameters. So within the whole set, within that file, all of those sheets are done. I can see where, where we've got a couple projects where we have multiple files, multiple Revit files that are generating sheets for a bigger compiled set. So we're having to make sure that that information is crossing projects. Um, yeah. All right, anything else? Any more questions? All right. Well, well. Th thank you very much for presenting for us for putting it together. And, um, thank you, um, um, folks here at uh, Mosley, for allowing us to host this user group here at uh, at your. This is a wonderful venue, so we really, really appreciate it, Julie. And uh, so we'll be doing this again in two more months. We have uh, a, a user group meeting each month in different cities. So um, be watching for the next user group in DC is is on Tuesday. So if you. Uh, I forgot what we're doing on Tuesday. It's really good. Trust me. VR construction. What? VR construction. VR construction. Yes. Really, yes. Really cool. Yes. And we'll, we'll actually have some Smith Group people over there. VR construction. We got another pre presentation, but it's all good. <laughs> so, so we hope, uh, Donnie, I assume you'll be projecting. So um, you can watch online. So let's see if we can get, and, and we, I'd like feedback of the online experience. If anybody uh, wants to try it for 10, 15 minutes, give us some feedback. We'd really appreciate that because we want to get this down so that we can serve you in, uh, either after these meetings or making sure that we got the content we request for it all the time. And then, and then Dana, your link we can send out. Just send it to us and I'll make sure everybody gets a hold of it. Thanks for coming out and we'll see you again in uh, two more months.